Thanks for coming. This is a bit scary. I guess this is my like first time on real stage after high school. Um, what can you do? Uh, now I guess you know I have to do the dance of like asking a question involving the audience. So who came to this talk because there is a Node.js thing there? Sorry, this is not really <laughs> about Node.js. No, there will be there will be even some JavaScript code, and you know, uh, there will be a part. But actually, this is just um, more of a story about adding a new stack to an or organization, and it just happened that it, it is uh, Node.js in our case. So yeah, hi, I'm Vilus from Vilnius. I'm a back and front and hell knows where right now, uh, working for three years uh, with Wix. And two years I was building a Node.js stack and whatnot. Uh, yeah, so I'm from Vilnius. It's a nice like old town, please come over. Especially during the summer, the winters are not great. So, you know, stay here, it's better. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about a bit like theory about microservices and what is a distributed monolith, then why, why am I talking about it at all, a uh, short history of adding a Node.js stack and Joyce at Wix, uh, and then about actual decomposition. As Martin Fowler says, puts it, microservice architectural style is an approach to developing a single application as a suite of small services, each running in its own process and communicating with lightweight HTTP, basically. So this is one of the definitions, and well, we do microservices, right? So it's like nothing new to us. Now, there is a thing in microservice world called a distributed monolith. So what, what, what is it? Um, it's a form of a binary coupling when in order to interact and coexist in a given system, you are required to use a set of official libraries. And important things there are required and official. This is the case when a client library becomes the only way to access the service. And you know, so like some team created a service, built a library so it would be easy for me to consume the service. It's like helping me, right? Um, yeah, up until the point. And it usually happens, or there is a really big risk that actually service logic starts drifting into the client. Uh, there are like performance considerations, optimizations and whatnot. But it is really risky, and uh, as a result, the service API itself, which initially might have been, you know, really nice, RPC, HTTP, whichever API, uh, becomes uh, really can become really op opaque and not really consum cons consumable without um, the client, and it leads to a situation where it becomes nearly impossible to adopt new architectures or languages. Because now you might have, I don't know, tens of these fat clients and you have to decide what, to do, what do you do with them. Uh, then in JVM you have all the transitive dependencies. So you have like uh, 10 services with fat clients which basically dictate you know what versions you can use must use and all the other mess um, and basically you you cannot adopt and make technical decisions within your service let's say you would want to move to a different threading model or some other you know changes and you are you cannot potentially but hey 
you know, do not repeat yourself, code reviews. I mean, they said it's good, right? Um, it is good, but it's not necessarily something you should prioritize in microservice architecture. And as Sam, Sam Newman puts it, the evil of too much coupling between services are far worse than the problem caused by code duplication. By the way, the book is really good by Sam. Uh, and you know, by, by doing this binary coupling and restricting yourself to, to like a single platform, you potentially lose possibility to be polyglot. Uh, and I'm not talking about case where you like all the possible platforms, languages and everything, but you, you, you just cannot you have multiple ones like Node, for example, right? You can eventually, but um, then you lose uh, organizational technical decoupling. So uh, where teams can evolve technically uh, without coupled collaboration. And you lose, you know, uh, temporal decoupling, where individual team can upgrade their stack, their dependencies, their threading model, request model, and what they what they really need. What is the alternative? It's simple, right? Contracts and protocols. It's like how internet is built, where you can. Uh, consume with any language uh, and any technology, iterate and change over time. This is what we do. Uh, and there is, well, there is no dependence on service implementation. Uh, but yeah, central logging, uh, distributed tracing, context passing, these are like concerns where if one of the services in your architecture is not like playing the game, you, you just don't have it. It's done, gone. Uh, well, you don't need binary coupling for that, actually. You just uh, use standard, standard protocols and contracts and uh, not official, but independent libraries. That is the key difference. And for other, you can have compliance contract tests. You can have them automated, which is like a gatekeeper to production. You comply, you get in, you don't. Sorry, come back again. Now, why am I talking about distributed monolith in the first place? Let's answer to two following questions, honestly. Does it take months to upgrade the library across company? Jackson. <laughs> and does it take around a year to introduce a new stack? Like even disregarding that, you know, engineers doing that are not great. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm working on it for two years and I'm not nearly done. <laughs> like nowhere near. I'm just, I guess, I just, you know. Um, and this is actually what I'm gonna concentrate on, like adding a new stack. So. Introducing Node.js at Wix. So as you have put it, as the you know, idea, that the target of this project is to enable coding front-end servers. So there is some niche which Node uh, should take, uh, or otherwise you know, serving, stat serving static pages and API gateway type of services. So given like current architecture where everywhere is JVM, uh, the idea is to replace JVM with Node.js and the initial limitations were that Node.js cannot directly access uh, databases nor let's say message brokers. I mean, the reality is different, right? You cannot tell engineers not to do stuff. So now we have a situation where like the, the front facing uh, part is uh, covered by Node.js and we have accessing database if you consider Mongo a database, but that is another question. And uh, message brokers are, seems like they're coming, coming in. I'm not sure yet. 
and it doesn't look too hard, right? You just took one thing, replace it with node, and how hard can it be? Well, there are some, some things we had to do. So, uh, like request flow from client, HTTP, comes to node, you call JVM via RPC, which is really nice JSON RPC2 protocol, standard. Well, but then we have all the, the headers, cookies, passing, signatures, writing back. So, again, this is not really that bad, it just work, right? Some reverse engineering, some not knowing if it actually works because it pretends like it works, but you'd never know. Uh, yeah, then, Petri, uh, I love you, the Petri team, really. <laughs> but you, you'll be mentioned around, uh, it's like because you, you're fat, so sorry, <laughs> client. Um, so yeah, it turns out we have quite some of fat clients. Petri, Gatekeeper is not that fat, but fattish, I would say, or chubby. How do you call it? I don't know in English. Uh, <laughs> but uh, then we had Hadron and much more. And actually, you know, these fat clients, they interact in interesting ways with, with each other. There is the context. So this is something we basically had to solve in Node. Um, yeah, ops contracts. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry for my art, I'm not great, but so this is basically the health check, whatever, you know, state machine. It's, there are more details, but, but basically this is what, what is imp was implemented in JVM. So like some flappiness prevention, amazing. I'm not sure you would do that right now. You know, if we would have two platforms, I'm not sure you would really move it to code. Maybe you would solve it in infra, but th this was something we need to solve. Not everything was like hard or bad. Uh, build deploy pipeline already had support. So like running through CI, deploying was, was like just understanding how it works and pretty much easy. Uh, contract for deployment was nice. There was like a wiki page actually, so it's like five environment variables and you're done. Good job. Uh, configuration same, like ERBs, not amazing, but at least it's not really hard to re-implement, understand, you know, and, and work with it. And actually the underlying protocols were standardized, so JSON RPC2 without any Wixi customizations except for headers. Uh, and our microservices um, do not really leak any JVM specific data types or anything. Maybe my mistake, you know, one or two, but, but really the, the, that, that part was nice and clean. It's still not really decomposing, but you know, let's start. Uh, by the way, there was never a goal to decompose, you know, or do something. The, the goal was to introduce a new stack in Wix to be leaner, to make us go faster. And the composition is actually, you know, I, I see it as a side effect. If you want to actually go faster, and not necessarily now, but in the future. You never know, maybe, you know, there will be a new stack that fulfills some, some goal for us really well. So it would be nice if it would take like less than two years to introduce it. So when we started, there is nothing. There was like, just do it. So this is like a code base, some, uh, you know, code snippets from 1K commits back in history. First one is Kfiris, I suppose, talk to Willis. Uh, then there is like RPC, which does, is like is working. But, but in practice it's not because it's not doing all that it should. And the, the last one is the is alive contract, which just says alive, basically. And I think actually it, it should be this simple, but, but you know, now we have all that state machine. So initially it was just, you know, do something, see it works. Um, then we got uh, fat clients as a proxy services. 
So for example, a Petri crew built as a service laboratory where they just wrapped the fat client in it and we could communicate with it and use Petri as a RPC service. And initial like scope wasn't that much, some ops, aspects, RPC, you know, just doing bare minimum. Uh, yeah, and then we got noticed. This is when developers heard about Node at Wix. Uh, there were some brave souls, you know, cowboys, renegades, uh, like one app crew, core free, block, insights, hotels, some others, who just started building services and deploying to production. Um, so yeah, we needed to cover some more stuff like monitoring, Petri, uh, maybe something else. We needed to solidify RPC aspects. Uh, and also, uh, the, the next you know, step was basically to build test kits uh, in uh, Scala and use them for contracts. So if I want to make sure that I can communicate with uh, Scala like RPC or get if something breaks to, to get a feedback. So this, is, this was next, like running JVM bootstrap apps from Node. Not amazing, but at least, you know, it's not uh, that, because if I write uh, tests in JavaScript, for JavaScript, it's my imagination of, of reality or if it works or not. This one tells me if actually node services can communicate with Scala services. And then more and more serious, you know, guys started coming in and this is when we got actually serious. Uh, and we decided to build compliance test. I mean, platform is proven. We know where we're gonna do Node. There is no more question. Uh, so compliance test, we decided to do them platform agnostic, though write them in Scala, because in Scala we already have a lot of buildup test kits, helpers for whatever. Uh, and we also uh, had, we have a lot of engineers that eventually could contribute, read, fix, add those. And the compliance tests basically uh, are platform agnostic, that, that meaning that current setup, you can plug in any platform, Node, Scala, service, doesn't matter. Uh, and they, they, you know, they, they, there is no really leakage of platform specifics. They're pretty generic and just exercise things that we consider to be uh, contracts. Um, yeah, numbers are not yet impressive. I think we have like 40, 40 something now contract test and Node is not doing really great. But at least we know that. So we know that Node is not really yet compliant and shouldn't be allowed to run in production, but oh well, you know, this is Wix. <laughs> but we just know that. So, so uh, once you know, it's easy really to fix or to, to, to align and make it compliant. Uh, and now we're still using like test kits, Petri test kit, gatekeeper test kit, but now we see that it's a bit uh, shaky and also that it's limiting because we need like the, the contracts uh, are much broader than what, what usually you do in end-to-end -end tests. And this is actually real code. So Scala trade for Node. And in addition, there is just Node app launcher. Uh, some, you know, BI keys, metric keys, adapters, which are not really generic. We consider those to be platform specific because JVM and Node, of course, there are differences in, in monitoring, for example. And it's really easy to add like Go, for example, and to, to you know, iterate and add it and make it eventually compliant is, is really easy right now. now we do have a lot of discussions, what is the contract and what it's not. So now, now we just, whatever is shared, basically, uh, or common behavior exposed by two currently platforms via public APIs. So something like app info page is not a contract, we don't care. Uh, context passing session, of course, it's a contract. 
But now we take a bit of lax approach, whatever shared contract, maybe it shouldn't be actually if you do like a lot of thinking about it. And you know, now I showed you the contract test and it seems like a bit of everything there, 50, 200, 500 eventually test. Uh, and yeah, it's, it is monolithic. But I, you know, I would like, this is pretty new thing. I would like for it to, to, to decompose itself. So for example, a part of it would migrate to P3 contracts, maybe even P3 team, I don't know. Uh, some would be like cross-cutting. Some could be like ops contracts, for example. We don't have yet those. Is your app compliant on deployment? Well, we know because we deploy, but we didn't yet backdate those contracts. And I feel like you know we, we are at the junction where given the state where current like JVM uh, is talking, has a fat client and talks to P3 server, and Node uses like P3 as a you know proxy, uh, we can do a couple of things. So one thing we could just start making the uh, Node P3 client like fatter and fatter, you know, grow it until it pre pretty much becomes uh, feature or behavior compliant to to like JVM, or we could actually. Uh, build a compliance test suite and which runs for any platforms so for JVM for Node.js maybe JVM 2 or another JVM implementation but basically if you know for me if if I would need to roll out I don't know go in Wix I would know there is a compliance test suite and once I'm compliant I can give my clients experiments same goes for ops, for gatekeeper, for RPC. So that, that in the end, we just don't do this reverse engineering and trying to figure out what's going on. We just set up compliance tests and I just like implement those or not, I choose, I guess, you know, and I'm good. And I would like for Wix eventually to pass a litmus test where, where we could say, can I actually take a team of engineers who are interested in X becoming legit thing in my service and actually build something without convincing the rest of the company? So this is what, where I would like for us to be. Thank you. Basically, whichever new feature we have to roll out now for Node, or for example, we uh, there was a requirement for some uh, uh, adding languages via experiments. So basically, somebody requested for that feature. We said, okay, so please add compliance it as for us, and we will become compliant. So there is no really a lot of work, you know, on compliance it as themselves or test suite. As I said, it, it is a like a monolith right now. We're just making sure that whenever we touch a code or change something, we think, is it a contract on which we want to be compliant? If so, we first add a compliance test. We expect for JVM part to pass, expect for node part to fail. And when it does, we then go to adding actually and writing code for the feature. So which are the failing tests for Node, and how do they affect production? Um, yeah, one I think I shouldn't tell. Uh, no, I th RPC server actually, so th that, that is not, not covered by, because we started doing those after. Uh, I think most of those are around uh, internationalization, and uh, and they are for some interesting things like uh, Scala service exposes endpoint to get la supported languages, like which is, eh, you know, um, <laughs> no, they, this is something we, we can easily catch up. Uh, then we have a session renewal, so where basically the, the server checks the session validity expiration. 
But so we we have it in backlog, but basically there are no really Scala services, uh, node services which do not do RPC. So we just delegate it to, RPC, to JVM services. We, you know, they will do the validation. Um, if I would have internet, I would check actually. But yeah. So these are some of those. But uh, w what are the problems then? We have, I guess, the Petri, right? That experiments can be conducted like true-false and then you don't know how to merge, all right? Those back, right? Um, so I think we can have this situation and we don't do currently anything about it. Uh, how are we planning to solve continuous integration between uh, JVM and Scala and Node? So basically the missing feedback, right? If the service provider changes API, node services break in production. Um, I'm not sure we're really doing anything about it for G's current implementation. I'm just hoping, you know, hope, engineering, uh, that uh, we'll get protobuf soon enough, right, with a proper IDL. Uh, and then uh, at least, you know, we will have a single, like we'll have an ideal, generate bindings, and then it's up to you. you if you have tests, you, you, you would break. Uh, I'm not sure if we will, like because there is another issue where we have separate CIs and they don't connect. So step by step. But at least I would like to have, you know, shared ideal. And then maybe you will not get immediate feedback, but at least now every night uh, modules are rebuilt in CI. So, you know, with a deal, like without doing anything, we would get immediate benefit on that. But for for uh, our current uh, JSON RPC2, we just not really solving that. Uh, we, we looked at it, there are some ideas and even like pull request pending for generating a JSON schema from uh, RPC services, but Jackson blocked it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.